Welcome again, everyone. I hope your morning has been productive. I'm sure it has. So, uh, like Kirsten was saying, we are heading into late here, you know, 10, 11 with this work. We were one of the first uh, districts in Rhode Island to implement uh, RTI. And as I have told you prior to this current position, I was the RTI coordinator for the district, which was really nice at the time because RTI, the district allowed us to focus and have one position focused around leading RTI. Um, and that, when like, you hear about my presentation today, really is one of the areas that helped make this whole work happen. Okay? So something um, that I kind of do when, when I come back with two districts, I have a call back and I, we had so many districts come and visit our, visit our school and, and learn about um, RTI. So over the years, I've put together this deck that, talk, that walks you through the, the top 10. Um, one of the, the main things um, is with RTI is that we have this really coordinated approach. So myself as RTI coordinator, the director of special education, and the assistant superintendent's office, we all work closely together to make sure that we were all on the same page. Um, RTI is not a special ed initiative. It's, it's an initiative for all students. And so that's you know something that, that is pretty much a myth. But sometimes people think that RTI is a special ed initiative. So it was important that we had the special education office involved but it was really important that we had the assistant superintendent's office involved because it's a regular ed initiative. It's an access for all students. So we really had this coordinated approach so that when we went out to develop these systems, it was universal throughout the district. Buy-in was really big because this was a new thing at the time. And this was you know, kind of the, the start of database decision making, the start of hearing about data in schools. And the start of hearing about evidence-based practice, research-based decision making, kind of following a more medical-based model in terms of in terms of that. So we had to shift the way we, we, we thought at the time. So we identified um, key leaders in each building, and we actually identified um, steering committees that helped us lead the work. And we were deliberate in who these members were of these steering committees. We also had some reluctant staff sit on these committees because we needed to have those reluctant staff buy into what we were doing and then help those other reluctant staff to buy in as well. So that was uh, a key thing we did. Uh, we built up that capacity there. Um, we really messaged that this was not more work, but it was different and targeted. We're going to be using a lot of the same resources, but in different targeted ways and in more data-informed ways so that resources are used efficiently and effectively. And then eventually the results spoke for themselves. You know, that took a few years to see. But on one of the first buildings we implemented RTI in Richmond, as Kirsten remembers, their um, state testing scores show significant growth. And I think RTI had a, a big piece to do with that. So I think like two years or three years after that, yeah. had the highest math score. So that right alone just, yeah. you know, changed the world. Yeah. I can see it. It was yeah. Yeah, yeah. really significant. So that helped too with, with buy in. Um, our approach was systemic and systematic meaning we went one building at a time. And when I tell you I was at Richmond School for a full year before we went to the next school, that's the truth. We wanted to roll it out real slow. When you roll out things too fast, too hard, they fail. So we went really slow in rolling this out, one building at a time. I did Richmond year one. Year two, because we had effective systems, I was able to do <coughs> two element, all the, the final three elementary schools that year. But then year three, the middle school and the high school. So it was very, you know, rolled out over um, a few years, uh, one building at a time. And we had those steering committees in each building. We also had universal design across all buildings. So it looked the same for any student that was going up to fifth grade here at the middle school. Their RTI plans would look the same from Richmond Elementary School to Ashway Elementary School. So we have four elementary schools in the district. So all that intervention information looked the same so that it was an equitable experience for all. We didn't want to have any inequity in terms of what our students experience. Um, I do have links there that walk you through our RTI process and flowchart. I emailed this to Kirsten. She yeah, has so we'll this. put it in your resource folder so that you can look through it after. She has this deck, so you'll, you'll have access to all these resources um, when you leave here today. Um, so our flowchart walk teams through exactly uh, the steps. Every year we conduct a star screening. You guys heard of star? A lot of your districts probably use it. In the fall, winter, spring, uh, K through 10, we do the screening. We only go up to 10th grade because research tells us we've identified students by this point. We don't want to waste um, you know, resources at this point. 
we doesn't mean we don't intervene for 11 and 12 readers, but we've caught them in other ways. Uh, so we do the star screening fall, winter, spring. Uh, we actually only do fall, winter here at the high school. Um, the school counselor psychologist runs the screen reports and prepares materials for meetings. Uh, a data review meeting is held. We look at all the data to determine what students are referred to initial RTI meetings. And we have initial RTI meetings with every student that's in the red, every single one. Uh, because even though, though we might know their behavior problem, we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about that academically. We want to make sure that we're truly identifying those students. And sometimes we we might not refer a student because we think it's a behavior getting away when it's truly the source is more academic in nature. Any student who has special education services may not get referred. For example, if they show up in their read and reading, but they have an IEP for reading, the IEP is a more intensive service. Okay? Um, but any student who's um, in the red automatically gets referred. And we also go into the yellow. So we, we typically go 20 into the, any student below the 25th percentile. All those students are referred to the RTI team. And we have an initial meeting for every student. Now, when we first started, those initial meetings were long. Like, here's to remember, it's like, it'd be like an hour long meeting for each student. For each student. <laughs> now we're at like, you know, six minutes max, maybe. <laughs> um, because we've developed efficient systems. Um, we know how to have meetings. We know how to get data quickly. We know how to we have our intervention uh, menus to pull from. We know what interventions are our go to. Um, so we have that process down. Um, so we develop an RTI plan at that meeting, and then we meet again it's about seven weeks later to review students' progress. We devote day, um, RTI meeting days, and I'll talk to you guys about that. But each building has their own RTI meeting days. When we first rolled out RTI, each building had like these 10 steps on what to follow for an initial meeting and a progress review meeting. So each team was following the same structured process in terms of what questions to ask for making intervention design, design decisions. I was just going to add in terms of the efficiencies, one of the things that uh, we developed over the last four years, and obviously I give Andrea all the credit for it, is one of the key efficiencies was having our specialists meet with departments, math and English, social studies if necessary, in their CPT time and bring the takeaways related to concerns about students or gaps about students to the meeting. Then we didn't have to pull teachers out of classrooms at odd hours when we were having our meetings and we ensured that we heard all the relevant stakeholder voices in terms of um, the people who were invested in that student in a much more efficient way. Those efficient systems have really helped us streamline the process for sure. Another big piece to, to why RTI is successful is tons of research went into you know this, this work. Like I said, it was new at the time, so we've already even changed screen tools. We used to use AIMSWeb. We've heard of AIMSWeb in the past. We feel like you know new tools have come out like Star, and we feel we love AIMSWeb. Thank you, AIMSWeb, for all the work you did for us. But um, you know we moved on to other systems that work better now. Um, we did a lot of research around evidence-based interventions, created menus for the district, um, progress monitoring tools. Um, based on specific deficit areas. So lots and lots of research. RTI Action Network is a great resource there. Put on the slide. Like I said, each building has a core team. It, we always have an administrator present just to hold teachers accountable to bring data to the table or making sure those pre-meetings are held. School site, who are trained in, um, I, I was a former school site, so trained in a lot of data and analysis, um, psychometrics, so that's helpful. Classroom teacher, specialist, guidance counselor, and sometimes a student, depending on um, the nature of the meeting. But we refined this, like uh, Greg had just mentioned to you, so these teams might look diff different. But we, each team has um, a commitment to at least one day per week devoted to RTI meetings. This is the case at the elementary level. They, they meet, like, you know, Richmond is every Wednesday, you know, Ashway is every Thursday. And, it used to be all different days of the week because I, as RTI coordinator, can go and sit in on all those meetings. We phase that out. We no longer have an RTI coordinator because if you develop, develop a strong system, that position is no longer needed. And that's what, when a system can run on its own, that's when we know it works. That's the true test to developing an efficient system you can pull back. And so that job became obsolete because we have strong systems, which is a great thing. You know? I love job security, but we can find another position. <laughs> So um, we at the high school have been able to, um, we do it where like Craig and I are paired with different school counselors and we, we rotate with them um, every six weeks out. But we used to meet once a week at the high school. 
Uh, technology led to transparency. We're very transparent. We project the students' plan up on the screen for everyone to see, and we all make informed decisions together as a team. And it's kind of a little visual of what our meetings might look like. All of the data, we have everything together. I'm not going to go through the questions. I'm sure time here. Um, but we have really strong data systems. We have them at the student classroom building and district level. When I was RTI coordinator, uh, made spreadsheets for each uh, this, each building to track all their RTI plans, what type of intervent, what area of intervention, reading, math, writing, social, emotional, um, whether it's a tier two or tier three intervention, whether um, who the teacher is, whether they were referred to uh, special ed eventually, and whether they were found eligible. That's really helpful data to collect at the district level, and that data showed us that our special ed referrals were becoming. Um, more accurate because we were identifying students who really needed special ed services um, and that, that was really validating to see. So we collect this at the, from the student level to, to district level data, which is really nice for the firms of work. We also have a really clear RTI to special education referral process. Um, there's a checklist that's linked there below. I'm not going to walk you through everything, but um, that's one of the hardest decisions to make. I used to be an assistant director of special ed. I sit at these meetings as assistant principal, and sometimes I'm like, really? I don't know if this is the right time to refer the student. Because you're like, Are, am I referring too early? Have we done enough intervening? So that checklist walks us through that. Some of the big things is how we tried a couple interventions. Has the student been there? If they've been absent, guess what? I'm not referring because they haven't been exposed to their intervention. Have we at least tried the most intense intervention at the tier three level? And they were counting on the specialist. And it, that is what took over time for the teacher to feel really empowered that they had what they needed to, to really personalize the learning for the student and provide the intervention. Yeah. And so we create even systems in the classroom, like around tier two. So if it was tier two, it was given in the classroom by the teacher and what that looked like. But it shifted the responsibility over time. Um, and that is when the teachers, like their beliefs started to change about what was possible because they could, that's when their efficacy, they could start to see, all right, when I do this, this is the outcome. But every time they wanted to push it, they didn't, they thought someone else needed to come in and do the work. And so that was like, a, that was a lot of where the transformation happened. And so now you're able to make those quick decisions, they're able to work together because they've seen the fruits of their labor over 10 years. And for those tier two students, the specialist acts as more like a consultant to go in and provide some modeling for what the intervention might look like in the classroom setting, give them a test for the teacher. Um, but yeah, we're really excited about this work. We're constantly tweaking things as we go along, for sure. Um, I did share with you uh, a bunch of resources here on this last slide. You have all of our flow charts. Um, you know, social emotional, we've done some changes there as well, um, we have a, a new referral process for social emotional needs, uh, or a referral packet that pretty much you know asks classroom teachers what have you tried in terms of tier two supports, and we list a lot of tier two, tier one, tier two type interventions that they can do within the classroom setting. We do a lot of work with um, self-regulation in our health classes. I don't know if you guys have heard of the zones of regulation. It's a strong program that's um, empirically supported. We've adapted it to fit the secondary level, which we're really excited about. Like because of the elementary level, there's like cartoons and colors, and we still have the colors here because students relate to that. But we've made it more inappropriate. Um, so we want to make sure we're reinforcing that language at the tier one level before we're, you know, referring to RTI. But we have a um, pretty robust uh, social emotional process, and you'll see um, our our paperwork. You'll see what our initial RTI forms look like. They're, they're all one pages. The, team completes at the meeting. Um, and then these are the protocols I was talking about. These used to be blown up in every um, like huge boards in every meeting room that walked the team through the steps, but now it's so ingrained within us. And then I also um, gave you guys here a list of great resources that we use to compile our interventions and whatnot. It's a lot, but it's broken down by you know academic areas. Great question. It's a really good question. So that's when uh, we might need to have a you know primary to have a conversation with the teacher about the need to you know maybe modify instruction. Like if there's multiple students from one class who, who you know 
know, are, are showing some significant needs. Maybe there needs to be more different instruction taking place, more flexible grouping, um, and that, that might even be an individual conversation we have with the teacher. If a lot of data supports that. Um, and Sometimes it involves taking a specialist and, and building them into the classroom for a couple of sessions just yeah. to, so that they can observe and see whether there's a translation between or a clear connection between the interventions that the specialist is providing and the gaps that have been identified in the classroom. And again, because our math department head and is, is also our specialist, that's facilitated a lot easier. So, so I guess my question is, I understand that your demographics have a different problem. So I wanted to know what does your RCI process look like for your we do have an ELL coordinator, and there are times if we have a student that an ELL student who um, shows up as flag based on the screen, we might invite him to the to the meeting to help us inform our decision making. Is this truly a reading deficit, or is it a language, language barrier? And we have that you know open conversation to, to determine which intervention. Because I hear you say that you start looking at your your um, star data. And you're looking at anyone basically from one to your ten percent. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking in my head, that's a lot of our students. Yeah, yeah. So we would have yeah. the majority of our students yeah. in this, or yeah. a good half of our students. We're, what a lot of people find too is really, it's like you flipped your model. Yes. It's like you really have to focus on tier one first, right? The tier one practices. So that, I mean, so you're seeing the difference. This is what you want to get to, right? So that you have strong tier one practices um, in your school. But a lot of times people say, our, our pyramid is flipped, right? Yeah. So, um, and that requires a different. That initial RTI meeting, we might say we need more data to make a decision. We might do additional additional testing. Our specialists, are, our specialists might conduct uh, running records. We try to have them do that before the initial meetings so that we're not wasting time. So we try to get a list of those students ahead of time during that data, that team data meeting, and start, start doing some initial testing as soon as possible so we don't waste that precious time. Something else I wanted to share with you is that what we did when we first rolled out RTI is we wiped all of our specialist caseloads. So any students that they had identified before based on teacher referrals was wiped, and we said RTI is your new caseload. Whoever comes up on the screen and the team decides these interventions, this is your new caseload. So that's all that us. Yeah, that was that was that we created. We needed to build some capacity and some buy-in there, but now, you know, it's just it's not even the same thought. Questions? I just think the other two pieces, like um, I don't know if you, I, maybe you're going to go in when you start talking about, it, but that the school is here and all the students are one to one, and then also some of your next steps, like around the data system. I know it's really quirky that you're rolling out. Oh yeah, but yeah, yeah. But I think it's just to see how it progresses yeah. over time. Yep. So um, we are a power school district, and there's an affiliate called um, Performance Matters, which is allows us to look at data at so many different levels for our students. All teachers now will have access to attendance, um, some behavioral data, like you know how many referrals, not like the specific incident information, because that's you know protected. But you know whether they're 504 IEC, um, they are state testing results. Um, major common assessment results eventually but to get there, but teachers will have this data at their fingertips now, which we're really excited about. Really, really excited. We've been trying so for so long to uh, be able to share the MCA first take versus second take results. If students don't pass right away, they're allowed to retake their exam. But our current system doesn't allow us to really capture that easily. So this is going to help us look at that important data too. So there's a lot of data sources that we can triangulate. Just as RTI was rolling out, a common assessment across the district was rolling out yeah. at the same too. And I think those two, although we sometimes talk about it, but that was like key, is that everyone was there were common assessments. And then you moved to more formative common assessments. Yeah. Is that right? Well, we had a, we had um, MCAs every quarter, major common assessments every quarter. Now we do them at the end of each semester. That's just as like three years ago, I think. But we also do so much more for the assessment. That's a, a big focus for us here in the district. All students have their own devices. Teachers have uh, many form of assessment resources and tools where they can see student assessment results real time. Like I was in a class, I'm sorry, I was observing a teacher yesterday and she was able to show me, look at all these students who were able to solve this problem wrong, see these three students here are able to work with this small group right now. So that, to be able to do that on demand is, is so key to instructional practice. It's a, it's a tier one, you know? So just so 
kind of reflecting on this concept of changing of expectations, probably the most challenging part of, besides managing time in education is when you change expectations. Our teachers have been on a learning management system called Canvas where they can um, upload and build all their assessments, rubric score them, uh, input that directly into PowerSchool for the last five years, but this PowerSchool um, performance manners, uh, matters analytics does not sync with Canvas automatically. So essentially what we're saying over time, our, our teachers are going to build in their major course exams and we're having uh, committees actually do that loading and then teachers can build their unit or formative assessments in it and get that real time data back. But anytime you tell a uh, faculty of teachers that, oh by the way, the platform that you've been using for your assessments for the last five years, in the next three or four years, we're gonna move it into this other one, lead balloon, you know? So um, thinking about um, challenging your faculty to the long game and understanding that we spent so much time um, gathering, consolidating data that we spent very little time analyzing and acting on it. And the value of Performance Matters is that that consolidating is going to be real time. It'll happen immediately as soon as the assessment is scored, um, plus all the other data, the benchmark data from STAR, their SAT, PSATs, their history of RADCAST scores, all of that information will be right there to give us a, a triangulated or quadrangulated or whatever the next word is view of who the student is. Um, so that they can concentrate their time and energy on analysis and action. <laughs>